It's not just aliens that invade our bodies. Steve Downard knows it firsthand. Steve has been growing citrus in Belize for the past 15 years, and he's learned that even simple farming can put you at risk. From this little insect, the bot fly. It doesn't look that scary. All it does is glue its eggs to a mosquito's stomach. And that's where the trouble starts. We spend a lot of hours a day here in the citrus farm harvesting and everything. And inevitably you get bit a lot here by mosquitoes, 25, 30, 50 times a day. That's just normal every day. And when the mosquito bites you, that bot fly egg transfers over to you and hatches out and burrows into your skin. And then the thing just starts to mature in there and you feel him biting and chewing and gnawing on you. And that's when you know you've got a bot fly and you need to get him out of you. It's called miasis. Fly larvae growing inside you. Whether you're a human or a cow, any warm spot will do. For the bot fly, it's a survival strategy that offers incubation, a ready-made meal, and protection from predators. And several times a year, Steve has to deal with it. They've got that little breathing tube and you just take a piece of duct tape and just put it over it when you go to bed at night and the next morning they've died from no air. The problem is, it's easier to get a bot fly than to get one out. Unfortunately, they have a series of hooks along their spines to make sure they stay hooked into your skin. Yep. Wow, Steve, that's a nasty one. You gotta get him out of there. He does not want to come out. Oh, I think he's coming. Get him, Chris. Here's his head. Hmm. Halfway out. Ah. Out. There he is. So much pain and so much trouble and everything, and it's that small. An adult one is ten times that size right there. If we left it come out on its own, it would be three quarters of an inch long, and the body would be as big around as a pencil. Kill it like we did with the duct tape. You have to remove it or that dead thing inside of you causes another problem. So there it is. But I'll tell you what, I'm sure glad to have it out. Gross survival mechanisms aren't limited to the tropics. Off the rocky coast of Iceland, there's one that's just as nasty. Wildlife biologist Dr. Ivar Peterson has spent a lifetime studying the birds of the Arctic like the northern fulmar, a cousin of the albatross. The fulmar spends all its life out at sea. They are distributed all over the Arctic and well into the temperate zone as well. They're very, very widespread birds. And their population just keeps growing, all because of one truly atrocious skill. It's a beautiful white bird, looks very clean. But it has a secret. When threatened, they throw up. These guys aren't just losing their lunch. It's a form of self-defense that's helped the species survive. They puke directly at their attackers. Vomiting is an innate behavior. They will do this from the day they hatch. The young birds, they have this as the only defense. And they will use it if they are cornered. This isn't just any vomit. This puke is special. It's sometimes brown, sometimes orange, and always fishy. The fulmar really likes oily stuff. They congregate near the fishing boats. They are after discards from gutted fish. What they really like is the liver. This becomes digested with the stomach oil and gets into a gooey, gooey mess. That is what they spit at you when you approach the nest. Hunted by eagles and falcons, or even inquisitive researchers, they can upchuck with accuracy at distances of up to 10 feet. For this job, Avar will need protective clothing. Whoop. 
This one wanted to take off uh, rather than phase us. It actually vomited a little bit. We can have a look at that. This liver is so fresh. It cannot have been in the stomach of the bird for more than 10 or 15 minutes or something like that. We'll find another one. We'll actually try and hit you with a spit. For these birds, this vomit is not just gross. It's a real weapon. Once this puke gets into an attacker's feathers, its chemical composition actually contaminates them, making them useless for flying or repelling water. And it's really hard to wash out. Oh, oh. Is, uh, that one really got me. Oh, this is quite an effective defense, I would say. It is oily and it's all over me now. Oh, I'll probably smell for a few days. Amazingly enough, islanders have actually been using the Falmer's oil for decades to light lamps, to treat wounds, even as an ingredient in suntan lotion. The stick on the helmet, it smells foul. Fulma means the foul god. That is the literal translation. This actually stinks quite a bit here with the... Uh, the gooey stuff on the uh, helmet here, so I better go and clean up now. Out in the Sonoran Desert, you need an edge to survive. The cactus has its spines. The lizard has its scales. And the turkey vulture has its own bag of tricks. In flight, with its immense six-foot wingspan, it's a thing of beauty. Up close, not so much. These vultures are nature's garbage men, and they're not afraid to take on the grossest meals. Sandy Cates has been studying the turkey vulture for 24 years. And one thing about the desert she's seen, there's never a shortage of death. For vultures, that makes it one big smorgasbord. It may stink, but since they're among the only birds with a sense of smell, that odor is like a dinner bell ringing. They're on this javelina right now. The wind's blowing this way, so you can imagine this thing smells really, really bad. It's full of flies and it's full of maggots. This black goo is oozing out of the eye, and one of those guys is pecking at the eye. Like a 20-year-old frat boy with a cast iron stomach, these birds can eat anything. Rotting flesh, maggots, six-day-old meat decomposing in the desert sun. Sandy has a special appreciation for their appetite. They have this system, and this system allows them to be able to not get sick from the foods they eat. They actually are immune to the bacteria. So they don't have to go get vaccinations and shots like we do. It's just simply awesome how nature has taken care of these birds. But the desert is harsh. Life here a constant challenge. The most challenging? To deal with temperatures that range from 32 to 132. To cope, these vultures thermoregulate. On a chilly morning, they spread their wings like a solar panel to soak up the sun. But when things heat up, that's trickier. They can't sweat, so they do something truly gross. Out here in the desert, we're sweating, and that sweat, when the breeze comes along, cools us off. These birds don't have that ability. What they can do is a little different. They cover themselves in wet feces. It acts like insulation, like something that's in your walls or up in your attic to help keep you cool. Amazingly enough, it can take them 20 degrees cooler than what they are. And believe me, 84 degrees compared to, say, 104 degrees is an amazing difference. When the breeze blows and that watery fecal matter begins to evaporate, the vulture is feeling pretty cool for someone who's just pooped himself. Kate's uses a thermal camera that displays heat as